and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Reno Scintigraphy Lecture. This is a rather confusing topic that hopefully we can clarify a little bit today. So we're going to talk about uh, standard radio pharmaceuticals. We'll talk about cortical rhinography that has essentially died out. We'll talk about diuretic rhinography. We'll talk a little bit about the renovascular hypertension and transplant. Uh, so the most important radio pharmaceutical that you should be familiar with is Technetium 99M uh, MAG3. So the tracer is rapidly extracted and excreted by tubular cells. So again, this is an active excretion process. It's excretion pretty quickly. About half of it uh, is extracted per pass through the kidneys. Uh, of course, uh, if the kidneys are not working, the uptake will be reduced, but it's not nearly uh, as much affected as the other radio tracers. The standard dose of MAG3, about 10 millicuries. For practical purposes, again, this is the most important tracer and practically the only one used in real clinical practice. So remember, 10 millicuries, uh, it's an active extraction process by tubular cells, and although it is affected by reduced function, it's not as much as the other tracers. Okay, other tracers uh, and the uh, uh, iodine I-131 OIH is really more of a historic interest. Uh, the only thing that you should know about it is, again, it's extracted by proximal tubules, uh, although the small component of it is filtered. Because of the beta emission by I-131, it's really not used in practical clinical practice. Uh, DTPA is used at some institutions. Uh, again, unlike MAG-3, uh, DTPA is predominantly uh, filtered uh, by glomeruli. Uh, it has about 20% extraction per pass. So in some institutions, uh, people do use it, although again, that is somewhat less uh, common. Uh, DTPA uh, filtration will be significantly diminished by abnormal renal function. So again, this is a really viable test question. So for MAG3 active extraction for uh, DTPA, it's uh, glomerular filtration. Uh, DMSA uh, used to be used quite a bit. Uh, this is the tracer that's uh, incorporated by renal tubular cells. Uh, only a small fraction of it is uh, filtered. So this is uh, used to image renal parenchyma, uh, primarily in kids for diagnosis of pyelonephritis or cortical scarring. Uh, same thing in cases of uh, vesicoureteral reflux uh, in kids. It can be used to assess uh, relative function similar to other tracers. Typical dose is 5 millicuries in adults, and in kids, of course, uh, it's a weight-based. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned for DMSA, that's uh, an agent used for cortical rhinography, uh, diagnosis of acute pyelorenal scarring and other parenchymal abnormalities. These days, it's uh, mostly historic interest because obviously we have things like contrast enhanced ultrasound, MRI, uh, dual energy CT. Uh, theoretically, DMSA has relatively low radiation dose, about one millisievert, which is why it used to be commonly used in kids for diagnosis of pyelo or scarring. This is how a normal scan looks like. I haven't been able to find uh, a decent example in our packs, again, reflecting that this is a uh, much more of a historic test rather than actively used test. So again, this is just a parenchymal agent. And this is an uh, example of pyelonephritis similar to CT, MR. We can see that uh, pyelonephritis presents with reduced perfusion. Obviously, these days uh, it's somewhat unnecessary to perform given the plethora of other imaging tests that we have. Okay, uh, let's start talking about diuretic rhinography, which is actually continues to be used uh, quite a bit uh, these days. Uh, what you need to understand uh, about the protocols is the timing for Lasix administration. And um, 
this is usually denoted uh, with uh, F plus or F minus uh, nomenclature. So the American Society of Fetal Urology typically recommends a protocol where the Lasix is injected 20 minutes after the radiopharmaceutical. So that's called F plus 20. So again, this is uh, uh, F for furosemide, and uh, plus means after. If it's a minus, it's before. So in the common European method, the diuretic is injected 15 minutes before the tracer. So that's going to be F minus 15. In the United States, commonly it's injected at the same time as Lasix, so that's going to be F0. So again, if it's a minus, the tra uh, Lasix is injected before the radio tracer. If it's a plus, it's injected after. So does anyone know what we actually do at Mercy? And why do we do this? Anybody? Anyone? All right. So what we actually do is we inject at 15 minutes. So ours is F plus 15, which is different from all of the standard protocols. Now, why? The true answer is that's because we've always done that. And we do have a number of patients that have been coming to us for years uh, for imaging tests. So rather than theoretical absolutes, it's important to be able to compare it to the historic results. So that's why we use uh, uh, F plus 15. The other reason is, in my experience, once we give Lasix, the patients need to run to the bathroom somewhat quickly. So it's not uncommon that the patient is not able to wait the entire 15 minutes afterwards, after the injection, and runs to the bathroom quicker. So injecting before the uh, tracer or injecting at F0 is seems to be a bit of a stretch it would really result in quite a few patients not completing the tests, but uh, that's what many labs do. Uh, so we do F plus 15, which is just a historic reasons for doing it. Now on the test, we do obtain a flow phase. Uh, we do uh, subsequent imaging for 30 minutes uh, with uh, injection of Lasix at 15 minutes. We use one minute images to calculate relative function. And then we'll look at the excretion times uh, or half times pre Lasix and post Lasix. Also, it's important to realize that, for example, in this particular case, uh, in uh, let's say if we we'll look at the post Lasix excretion half times, it's four minutes on the left and 11 minutes on the right. On the other hand, if we we'll look at pre Lasix excretion half times, it's 13 minutes on the left and nine minutes on the right. So on the right side, we've excreted a substantial portion of the tracer before we administer the Lasix. So what happens after the Lasix is no longer that relevant because most of the tracer is already gone. Uh, and that's why we're seeing this sort of reversal of half times pre and post Lasix. So to understand the post Lasix half time, we really need to look at the pre. In theory, uh, some, uh, it's possible to uh, just image the kidneys, let's say, for 30 minutes and then decide whether the Lasix needs to be given or not. But that implies that we always need to have a attending or resident in nuclear medicine uh, ready to look uh, at each study at all times, which is a bit uh, uh, impractical on a daily basis. So it's just easier to always give Lasix. Okay. Um, for diuretic venography to work right, uh, it's uh, important that the patient is well hydrated. Uh, although, again, patients generally don't follow the instructions optimally. Some institutions will give IV hydration, but I find that to be somewhat of an overkill. So ideally, at the time of scheduling, the patient is instructed to drink plenty of fluids before. Normal values. Uh, uh, have been established, but they really have been established for kids. Normal values for adults are somewhat lacking. So for F plus 20 protocol, the normal values are uh, less than 10 minutes is normal, uh, 10 to 20 minutes is indeterminate, and more than 20 minutes, uh, excretion half time identifies obstruction. So again, these are normal values for pediatric kidneys in adults and especially in uh, cases of uh, suboptimal uh, GFR, the excretion half times will change. So uh, again, 
normal values are established for kids. For F minus 15 protocol, uh, normal half time is 20 minutes. Uh, so more than 20 minutes is compatible with obstruction. For F0 protocol, again, the published uh, abnormal value is 20 minutes. So again, take these numbers with a grain of salt because these are pediatric values. And certainly if there is a dilated extrarenal pelvis or de diminished GFR, the excretion half times can increase. Another approach uh, to interpretation is to look at the shape of the curves. I'm not a huge fan, but there is some value to that. So for F minus 15 protocol, which is the top uh, uh, curves, uh, curve one is normal, curve two is obstructed, curve three, which is mislabeled as four, is equivocal. Uh, for F plus 20 protocols, again, similar uh, rules apply where Curve one is normal, curve two is obstructed, and the other curves have uh, various values of equivocal or uh, complicated. So uh, this is an example uh, of one of our patients where we can see the excursion half times uh, changing uh, on different dates and uh, so we have excretion half times on the left of 15 and on the right is 10 uh, on a different day uh, both excretion half times and 9 and the only thing that's changed is patients uh, GFR so again the excretion half times have fluctuated so if we stick rigidly to uh, uh, normal of uh, less than 10, uh, we can see that on images on the left, we would be in the abnormal category. Uh, however, you know, again, this is just GFR fluctuations, although interestingly enough, both shapes of the curve would theoretically be considered normal. Uh, comparative studies uh, between all of the protocols are somewhat lacking. Uh, in this particular example, they've actually managed to compare F plus 20 with F0 and uh, F minus 15 protocols. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was no difference between F0 uh, and F minus 15, but both of those seem to be superior to F plus 20 protocol. So uh, again, with an F plus 20 protocol, they would have missed one obstruction that was seen on the uh, F0 and F minus 15. Uh, this is another study where, again, showed uh, similar uh, findings. In this particular case, they compared F plus 20 and F minus 15. So um, there was uh, more equivocal results in F plus 20 protocol. Despite the equivocal results, those patients did undergo surgery. Uh, and again, with F minus 15, they found obstruction in 76% of the patients versus half in F plus 20. So again, this seems to be a trend that earlier injection of diuretic seems to be superior to later injection of uh, diuretic. But again, all of the studies are relatively small. Uh, so it's hard to be absolutely certain. All right. So let's look at some clinical cases. Uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> we can try in practice to figure out what, what works, what does not work. Okay, so I'm sure uh, by now all of you have uh, looked at this, and is this normal, abnormal, or borderline? Okay, and the answer is, of course, abnormal. So if we look at the, both of the kidneys, uh, if we look at the left kidney, pre lasix administration, there is essentially no trace or excretion uh, from the kidney. Uh, and uh, after the LASIX administration, the excretion half time is 24 uh, minutes. So that's uh, relatively abnormal. We can also see that the left kidney has noticeably less tracer activity. There's also increased time to pick uh, of uh, uh, 1300 seconds versus uh, 840 seconds for the right. So left kidney is abnormal in comparison to the right. On the right kidney, we can see that, again, pre lasix there is uh, no uh, tracer excretion. And after LASIX, the right kidney is clearing with 14 uh, minutes half time. So again, 
the uh, test should be interpreted as obstruction on the left and normal on the right. And in this particular case, uh, correlation with CT shows chronic UPJ obstruction on the left side. We also see cortical thinning due to the chronicity of obstruction, uh, which uh, again uh, helps us to, uh, which again correlates with abnormal uh, function and diminished function of the left kidney. On the right, uh, again, we can see that this excretion half time of 14 uh, minutes is normal for this patient and simply uh, reflects uh, chronically diminished kidney function rather than this uh, uh, equivocal 10 to 20 minutes range. So again, uh, use uh, uh, less than 10 uh, as always normal, 10 to 20 correlate clinically, and more than 20 is abnormal, and this should generally enable you to navigate through virtually all of the cases. Okay, let's look at another case. Is this normal or abnormal? And I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at this. And I'm sure all of you have uh, quickly concluded that this is abnormal. We can see that the left kidney is um, taking the tracer, uh, excreting it into the collecting system, uh, and we, we see quick opacification of the ureter. Uh, in the right kidney, uh, what we see is uh, uh, prompt uh, tracer excretion. So if we look at the excretion half times on the left, uh, it's uh, zero minutes pre six. On the right, it's six minutes pre six. So right automatically becomes uh, normal regardless of anything else. On the left, if we, once we look uh, at the post six excretion half time, we see uh, it's 19 minutes. On the right, it's 12. We don't care if the tracer is already excreted. So uh, 19 is abnormal given the fact that we're not excreting relatively pre six. The fact that we saw a uh, tracer a little bit in the urine, uh, uh, in the ureter doesn't matter because, again, overall the kidney seems to be accumulating. And when we correlate um, uh, with CT, uh, we see a stone in the left ureter with hydronephrosis on the left side, and the right side is normal. Again, right side excreted most of the tracer even before uh, we gave Lasix. On the left, uh, post Lasix, the excretion half time was 19. So uh, in this particular case, again, using some reasonable judgment, we were able to conclude that there is obstruction rather again than sticking blind, blindly to these 10 uh, to 20 thresholds. Okay. Let's look at this case. Is this normal, abnormal, or borderline? So by now, all of you are really experienced uh, nuclear medicine physicians, so I'm sure everybody will come up with the right conclusion very quickly. So in this particular case, the study is abnormal, as every other case that I'm showing you here. Uh, and. Um, what we're seeing here is, again, similar as the previous case, there is ureteral stone in the right kidney causing hydroureter and hydronephrosis. And when we look at the excretion half times uh, on the uh, left side, uh, we see, uh, again, relative absence of excretion uh, pre, again, 240 minutes. Excretion half time doesn't matter, but once we give Lasix, left side shows excretion half time of 11 minutes versus the right side that shows excretion half time of 21 minutes, which would be abnormal. So uh, again, uh, you know, if we were sticking to 10 and 20 cutoffs would be in trouble, but relatively speaking, we can see that uh, relative comparison of excretion half times works pretty well. So we can use uh, then uh, left kidney with 11 uh, minutes as a uh, normal example, and the right kidney with 21 is abnormal. Again, correlates pretty well, obviously, with presence of a stone and hydronephrosis. Certainly, uh, this would generally not be performed as uh, uh, Lasix renal scan followed by CT normally. CT would be followed by Lasix renal scan to determine severity of obstruction. 
okay and in this particular case we actually have a study after the stone has passed and we see once the stone passed the excretion half time on the uh, left uh, becomes six minutes as opposed to 11 and on the right becomes eight as opposed to 21. Now remarkably enough we're seeing improvement of excretion half times on both sides and this is probably because the patient was really well hydrated to allow the passage of the kidneys as opposed to pre. So again, uh, this will, uh, the excretion half times will, will fluctuate depending on the degree of hydration, but we can see that on the post, because the excretion half times and the curve shapes are similar in both cases, again, we can easily interpret them as normal versus before uh, the relative comparison enables us to say which side is normal and which side is abnormal. Uh, this again also underscores that uh, the excretion half times and the curves will fluctuate depending on the renal function and the state of hydration. Okay, let's look at this case. Is this normal, abnormal, or borderline? And I'll give you a few seconds to look at this. And I'm sure all of you have quickly concluded that this is abnormal as every other scan that I'm showing you today. Um, we can see that uh, prior to administration of Lasix, uh, again, both kidneys, practically speaking, uh, show no Lasix excretion, uh, no tracer excretion. And after we give Lasix, uh, left kidney shows excretion a half time of seven minutes, so that is normal. And the right kidney shows excretion a half time of 24 minutes, which is considered abnormal uh, by comparison, and again, this is above 20 minutes. And when we look at the CT, uh, theoretically, we claim that uh, there was a partial uh, right uh, ureter vesicular junction obstruction by bladder to the diverticulum. That's supposedly I'm showing you on this CAT scan, but uh, even I'm struggling to see that. Although, again, this was our conclusion. Okay, let's look at this case. Is this normal or abnormal? A borderline. I'll give you a few seconds to look. And I'm sure all of you have quickly concluded that this case is definitely abnormal. Um, in practical reality, if we actually look at the images, there is no tracer activity in the right kidney. And essentially, we're looking at the soft tissues. The differential function is 96% right and 4% left. But left is not real function. This is just a background activity. So practically speaking, there is no left kidney functioning. So that excretion uh, curve is essentially no, uh, nonsense. Uh, and all we're really seeing is um, uh, vascular blood pool in the soft tissues that's been cleared by the uh, right kidney. So again, don't just look at the curves, make sure you actually look at the kidneys itself. And if there is no activity, uh, don't be uh, distracted by just a nonsensical uh, curve. And in this particular case, a patient had uh, left uh, xanthia granulomatous pyelonephritis, and at this point, the kidney is essentially completely dead. Uh, we see the typical appearance of st uh, uh, stone in the calyx. Uh, the collecting system is uh, scarred down around the stone, and we see that the cortex is paper thin, so that kidney is no longer uh, executing any tracer. So even getting rid of the stone, uh, putting nephrostomy or stents is not going to be successful because at this point, kidney is dead. So uh, to alleviate chronic infection, uh, this kidney should be surgically removed. Okay, this is another example. Um, this is an elderly patient where uh, we elected uh, to make up hydronephrosis on the right side and uh, urology was consulted and appropriately decided to obtain a Lasix renal scan to decide whether this is normal or abnormal. And actually when we look at the kidneys, again the patient had renal insufficiency, so we see prolonged excretion half time, so prolonged tracer excretion, and of note the excretion uh, on the right is actually quicker than the excretion on the left. So this slight dilatation of the renal collecting system was uh, meaningless. 
both kidneys excreting slowly, but they excreting relatively symmetrically. So there is no obstruction, just suboptimal renal function. Okay, now this case is a true expert challenge. Uh, if you can figure out this case, you can figure out anything. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at this while I have uh, some tea. Okay, so is this normal, abnormal, or borderline? Okay, so let's look uh, at the numbers in this curve. So we see that the right kidney pre Lasix is 23 minutes, so again, poor excretion. However, uh, so, so left, uh, pre Lasix 23 minutes. The moment we give Lasix at seven minutes, so uh, left kidney is in the clear, that's normal. On the right side, pre Lasix, we have uh, zero, again, no excretion. And post Lasix, we have 39 minutes. So that would suggest uh, significant obstruction. Now, let's look at the images of the kidneys themselves. So in uh, on the early ones, we see in kidney, but then uh, as we'll keep looking at the right, it looks really, really strange on the la on the last images, sort of. Uh, suddenly there is like a, a big blob that seems to be obscuring the kidney. And what this case actually represents is there is a nephrectomy with uh, new bladder or I guess ileal loop conduit or whatever this was. Uh, it actually overlaps the right kidney on the images. So the reason we're seeing this prolonged excretion half time is there is pulling of the excreted tracer in the neobladder or ileal loop conduit that actually ups, uh, obscures the kidney. So there is no obstruction. The excretion half times are normal and this is just an artifact. So this is a good lesson why all of the uh, nuclear medicine scans and including renal scans should always be interpreted in conjunction with some uh, real anatomic imaging because it's really easy to just uh, look at the curve, say obstructed and then move on. Uh, but uh, once we see the anatomy and realize that the new bladder overlaps the kidney, we can easily uh, get the right answer. Okay. Uh, let's briefly talk about renovascular hypertension. Now, uh, this used to be really, really popular. Um, and uh, on one hand, uh, we had pure anatomic imaging. So with uh, CTA, MRA, and uh, renal Doppler stenosis. On the other hand, we had physiologic imaging. And the reason uh, this works is uh, presumably in cases of uh, uh, renal uh, hypertension and renal stenosis, the kidney was uh, increasing renin levels uh, to maintain perfusion, and uh, that was also driving the hypertension. So the thought was is that patients that were positive on uh, nuclear medicine tests were the ones that were likely to clinically benefit from relief of renovascular hypertension. Uh, however, large-scale studies seem to show no benefit uh, for treatment of renal vascular hypertension, so this is why this whole field tended to die. Um, so the gist of this is, again, that in patients with renal vascular hypertension, physiologists suggest that driving up renin would seem to be the compensatory mechanism, and by giving ACE inhibitor, we could disrupt that compensatory mechanism. Uh, so, uh, essentially what would happen is, again, renin would be used to maintain kidney perfusion in GFR, so if we give ACE inhibitor, we would disrupt the compensation, so the excretion curve would deteriorate. Uh, these were some of the criteria that were recommended uh, for patients uh, to qualify for testing. Again, this sort of uh, went out of the window after large-scale studies showed no benefit in treatment of renovascular hypertension. So there are two ways of doing that. One was to do uh, a baseline uh, renal scan and then perform a second one uh, after giving an ACE inhibitor to see if the excretion curves would change. Uh, 
a more uh, efficient protocol was to start with uh, ACE inhibitor study first, and then if it's normal, stop. If it's abnormal, then perform a baseline study uh, without ACE inhibitor and compare both. Uh, so for renal vascular hypertension study, again, the patient should be well hydrated. Uh, they shouldn't eat because giving away uh, captive pill to patients like this could induce hypotension, so sometimes you could run into trouble. For patients who want to own diuretics or ACE inhibitors, both uh, should be stopped for at least several days prior to the test. But uh, for patients who are really hypertensive, that could, po could pose problems all of on its own. So uh, this is how the test was supposed to be interpreted. Uh, there's a variety of curves. Uh, curve zero is presumably the known, uh, is the normal curve, and all of the other curves would reflect uh, deterioration of the test uh, of the kidney. So uh, presumably what we would see is uh, a baseline would be curve zero, and then a repeat test with captopril would show a curve like curve one and curve two, and then we would conclude that yes, with uh, uh, ACE inhibitor, renal function deteriorates, therefore uh, there must be increased readiness from renovascular uh, stenosis. So the patient, in theory, should be treated, but again, that didn't pan out. So uh, the test was supposed to be uh, interpreted as low probability if uh, uh, both uh, were normal, uh, high probability it, when there's a significant change between the baseline and post-ACE inhibitors test, and intermediate when actually both were abnormal, uh, but uh, uh, did not, there was no significant change. So as you see, this immediate intermediate probability strikes again uh, in, uh, in, in uh, renovascular stenosis studies. It's not only uh, for VQ scans. So in nuclear medicine, we just love our intermediate probability. Okay, so this is presumably an example of uh, abnormal test where uh, there was a renal artery stenosis and the renal function deteriorated after administration of uh, ACE inhibitor. So uh, at Mercy in the last 10 years, I think we may have done one or two tests, but none of them were uh, clinically useful. Okay, uh, lastly, uh, transplant scintigraphy. Um, this is uh, a topic that sort of refuses to die. Uh, and uh, even if no one does any more clinical studies on it, people do meta-analysis of everything that was published over the past decade. So I used to say that, you know, the last publication was in like uh, 2013, but subsequently uh, my uh, repeat search revealed even recent publications on this uh, topic. So in theory, um, renal scintigraphy was used to differentiate ATN and uh, rejection. And the thought was is that uh, rejection presented with uh, diminished flow, uh, delayed uptake and excretion. However, ATN was supposed to show good flow and delayed uptake and excretion. So the only differences were just flow. But, you know, using uh, nuclear medicine scintigraphy for flow assessment is a rather painful exercise. Uh, the latest studies have uh, seem to focus on if there is poor uh, uptake and excretion that, pre uh, uh, that has a poor long-term prognosis. But on the practical reality, ability to tell ATN and rejection is poor, so you really have to do biopsy. Uh, also, uh, what are you going to do if uh, there is a poor function? Well, the transplant eventually is going to just deteriorate. So. Uh, by simply waiting uh, whether it's going to function or not, we will get that information. So this value of uh, predictions is relatively poor. So in clinical reality, telling the difference between ATN and uh, rejection with a renal scintigraphy is very, very, very difficult. And it essentially, it's just a flip of the coin based on my experience. So I don't recommend this in uh, practical reality. Okay, so try to remember is that DTP is glomerular filtration. 
uh, MAG3 is tubular excretion, and DMSA is uh, tubular incorporation. Okay, and thank you for not falling asleep, or if uh, you did, you can wake up now. Uh, uh, the lecture is over. Thank you.